Hi, everyone, and welcome to Aortic Athletes. I'm Carmen David. I'm an aortic dissection survivor and an aortic athlete. And I am Jack Crow. I am an aortic dissection survivor, and I'm an aortic athlete, too. Hey, Carmen, how you doing? Um, I could be a little better. I'm a little sore from chasing my daughter through a 5K on Saturday, so I'm kind of recuperating. <laughs> <laughs> well, She's a lot quicker than me at 10 years old. Yeah, that only gets worse over time. Uh, well, you know, before we have a special guest tonight, but before we get to that, I wanted to ask you, Carmen, what does exercise look like for you lately? Well, lately I haven't been running much, but I kind of changed, switched gears and started hiking a lot more with my dog, which I thoroughly enjoy. I actually just got back from Hawaii a couple of weeks ago and did some amazing hikes there. And uh, so now my goal really has been for a couple of years now to get to some more national parks and do some better hiking than I can find in Dallas-Fort Worth area. So that's going to be my goal for the end of the year. So how about you? Well, you know, I, I did this little thing called the New York Marathon in November. And after that, I just kind of stopped running completely and just did my usual walking routine. But you know what's happened? We've had a very mild winter here in Chicago. And so I find myself kind of little by little by little sort of speed walking. And now I've added in some jogging. And all of a sudden, I find myself, you know, instead of doing the walk run, just doing the jog. And uh, so something's happening. Spring must be around the corner. In Chicago, the big kickoff race is the Shamrock Shuffle, like an 8K in, um, sometime in March. So. I have a funny feeling I'll be doing it. Awesome. <laughs> well, as everybody uh, may not be aware, we actually started Aortic Athletes about a year ago now, and this was to support other people with aortic disease who want to live an active lifestyle. Yeah, and I, Carmen, I think we just passed 600 members from around the world. Yeah, uh, it's so exciting. In all stages of aortic disease, from dilations to dissections. And uh, it's really been a, a joy, I think, for, for I know for me, it personally, it has been. And uh, also, so we want to encourage folks who are watching to join Aortic Athletes on Facebook. And we also want you to join Aortic Hope, our sponsor here today, uh, that has this wonderful uh, live YouTube platform. Uh, and in particular, I commend, if you haven't seen it, the great um, Aortic Dissection Handbook for people who have di recently dissected. I wish I had it when it happened to me. It would have made my life much easier, but it's kind of like a how to uh, recover and get on with your life. So we, we invite you to join both Facebook groups, get the Aortic Hope uh, new uh, patient guide and uh, and who who are who is this other person on the line today? Let me see who that is. <laughs> so we have interviewed um, a lot of impressive cardiologists, obviously on here, focus on aortic disease and exercise. But today we're going to do something a little bit different. We have Dr. Diana Milowitz here, and she wears a lot of different hats in the aortic community. Uh, she is a renowned researcher in the area of genetics and aortic disease at the University of Texas. And she and her team have discovered many of the genetic markers known today uh, to cause familial thoracic aortic dissection and aneurysm and connective tissue disorders. She's on the board of the John Ritter Foundation and the aortic community and myself. I'm proud to call her friend. So welcome, Dr. Diana Milowitz. Thank you. Very happy to be here. And um, so I was, uh, I was asked to talk about the genetic predisposition to thoracic aortic disease. And, um, and we know for a long time that in the human genome, you know, all, that's where all the, the information that's stored to make all our organs and our body. We've known that you could just alter one gene out of 20,000 genes that we have in our genome and have a very, end up with a very high risk of, um, for aortic aneurysms that progress to aortic dissection if they're not repaired. And uh, we know that from patients with Marfan syndrome. We've known about Marfan syndrome since the late 1800s. And about the 1950s, it was realized that patients with Marfan syndrome died prematurely 
due to aortic dissections. And then with the, about the, actually the first surgery to repair aortic aneurysms and aortic dissections were done in Houston. Actually, Denton Cooley and DeBakey scrubbed in on the very first case of the repair of a dissection patient who dissected across the street from the Texas Medical Center at Rice University. It was a faculty member. So, um, so at nine, in the 1950s, we started understanding the, this genetic predisposition through patients with Marfan syndrome, but at the same time, they were starting to repair dissections and aneurysms. And what we found out that with patients with Marfan syndrome, if, if, we, if they get diagnosed and they're followed and their aneurysms are monitored, that we can go in and repair the aneurysm when it gets to a size where there's a risk for dissection. And if we do that, then the people, instead of dying in their mid forties on average of an acute aortic dissection, which was what was described in the 1950s, now they can live a near normal life expectancy. So for me, this became, you know, the sort of the, the goal of my career. So we know with Marfan syndrome, if we diagnose somebody, we can prevent those deadly dissections and all, even if somebody survives, there's a lot of downstream complications. And so, um, but if we take a Marfan patient, monitor them, repair the aneurysm, we can completely prevent the sudden deaths and they can go on to have a normal life. So my goal of my research program was to go through the DNA and try to find all the genes like the Marfan gene that predispose people to aortic disease. And really we now know that one out of five individuals has aortic disease running in the family. And then these are people that don't have Marfan syndrome. And so that's a pretty big genetic burden for this disease. If you look at something like breast cancer, you know, BRCA1 and 2 only make up a small percent of the disease. So to have, you know, 20% of the disease being inherited in the family is really high. And so, um, and that we know if we have the right information about the mutant genes that we can also prevent sudden deaths due to dissections in those fam families once we find the gene, okay? So we've been working to identify genes. We're up to about 20, over 20 genes. 11 of them have gone through this very stringent certification process that is done with a, um, a committee that's experts in genetic aortopathy, and I serve on that committee. And, that, and so those are the 11 genes that we use clinically, and it includes genes like the Marfan gene, FBN1, the Lois Dietz syndrome genes, the genes for vascular air loss, Dan Lowe syndrome, but then a whole bunch of genes where they don't have all these syndromic, all those features that you see in a typical Marfan patient or patient with Lois Dietz syndrome. So we have the 11 genes. There is another, you know, 10 genes that are waiting validation. We just need more data published and more mass models made of those genes to really confirm them. But this only explains about, like I said, one in five families have an inherited predisposition. And those 11 genes only explain about 30% of the disease. So we have a lot more genes to identify. And so um, the next, so we are really working hard to identify those genes. So if you have, you yourself has ha have, have a family history of dissections and you've tested negative based on genetic testing, you've had those whole 11 genes checked along with probably the next 10 genes on the list. And um, so that means you're one of those families we haven't solved yet. So please, please contact me so we can, if you're interested in participating in research, so we can find the rest of the genes. We have about 1,300 families in our study, and that translates to over 5,000 people participating in that particular study to find the rest of the genes. 
So in the meantime, in families where we don't know the gene, so once we find the gene, it becomes powerful information for a bunch of reasons. One is um, we can go through the family and figure out who else is, is at risk for having a dissection, then put them on protocols to prevent dissections. And um, so we can prevent other family members from having the same problem. And John Ritter's family, he's a comedian that was very popular in my era, not so much in the younger era like Carmen and so on. But his family also illustrates how we can take care of family members even if we don't know the gene. So Don, John Ritter was 53 when he died of his aortic dissection. He was actually filming his his, his last sitcom that he was on at that time, and he actually dissected on the set of the sitcom. After his death, I, you know, I worked with the family to get the family history, and his father was Tex Ritter. He was one of the singing cowboys back in the 1920s and 30s with Roy Rogers and other cowboys that were very famous in like uh, movies at that time. And he himself, when he's, he was in his early 60s, he was actually in Nashville bailing out a band member who had gotten had been drunk and disorderly the night before. And he, he had chest pain and dropped dead. So he may have died of a dissection. So we took that information and just, we didn't know the gene and we still don't know the gene in John's family. That's one of the families that's unsolved. But we imaged everybody in the family. We imaged his, um, his mother and father had both passed away. We imaged his brother, found an aneurysm repaired the aneurysm and his brother is still alive today, 20 years later. So what, it shows that if you just image people and find those um, aneurysms in families, you can still prevent di dissections without knowing the gene. And we're following all of John's children to make sure that they're watched carefully for the development of aneurysms, because right now they would be at as high as a 50-50 risk for having an aortic aneurysm that could progress to dissection. So, um, so that is the way that we're managing. Um, okay, so it becomes powerful information if you find the gene for the family members, but you can figure out who's at risk, even if you don't need, know the gene by imaging the family members. But if you know the gene, it's also powerful information because we can put together a group of patients that all have mutations in the same gene and say, how does their aortic disease behave and what happens to them? Because that'll tell us, number one, how to, when we have to go and repair that aorta as the aneurysm gets bigger and bigger. It'll tell us whether um, and tell us what the risk is for di those descending dissections, those type B dissections that, that people can have also. So, um, but it also tells us if they're going to go on to have other problems with the arteries in their in their body. So some genes will cause people to go on to have aneurysms in their brain. And then once again, if we know they're there, we can go in and repair them and prevent any strokes or death due to a rupture, brain aneurysm rupture. But then other genes cause early onset heart attacks. And we know how to treat those. So it just becomes very powerful information for predicting what the course of the disease is going to be in somebody once we know what that defective gene is. And then we can get up ahead of the disease. One of the reasons I work on this disease is because the cardiovascular system is basically plumbing. So if we can go in and fix the plumbing, then you've solved the problem. And that's what we do with the aneurysms to prevent those dissections. We take the disease, you know, the surgeon opens up the chest, takes the disease aorta out and puts in a man-made um, tube made out of da a Dacron or Gore-Tex like material. And that lasts for a lifetime. We don't have to do, you know, it's going to withstand everything. So um, it's just fixing the plumbing. The same thing with atherosclerosis. That's where the arteries get closed off. And, you know, most everybody knows that we can 
put in stents to open them up, or we can um, go in and actually do bypass surgeries around the closed off our artery. So these, once we know what's running in a family, and in particular, if we know what gene is causing the disease in the family, we can really make sure that we get ahead of the disease and prevent problems. So I've been working on this disease for over 25 years, a long time. My lab has found the majority of genes that we know, but and we're really working hard to find the rest of the genes. And thank you to everybody that's already participated in our research. Um, but that's only 20% of the disease. We still have 80% in people that just have the dissection and nobody else in the family's had a problem. We image the family members, there's no aneurysms, no histories of dissections or sudden unexplained deaths like there was in Tex Ritter, you know. And so what about those people? And we know those people can dissect anywhere from, you know, in childhood all the way up to 70 or 80 years old. And so we're really working hard to try to figure that out too. And we'll be launching some more um, studies to recruit patients with type A dissections, those ascending dissections. And then we already have a grant in to get all the type B dissections, those descending dissections. So we can really work what we want to do is get the you know, the patients recruited, get their clinical information, you know, what they were doing before the dissection, what drugs they were on, what supplements they were taking. So we understand those environmental risk factors, things like hypertension and those um, antibiotics, the fluoroquinolones that hopefully everybody's heard about. And then find if, if there's other toxins, aortic toxins out there that increase the risk for dissection. I, I think we're still missing some of those aortic toxins. And then we get DNA from everybody and we can do the genetics. And we can also share the data with researchers around the world so that people can analyze the data in different ways so that we make sure that we use every new technology or method or protocol like AI or machine learning and everything that's coming along and apply it with the goal that, you know, 10 years from now, when we all have our genome sequenced as part of our medical care, we can at that point go through the population and talk, say somebody that's a, you know, a 30 year old, you know, tell them they're at a pretty high risk for dissections. Let's start imaging you. Let's make sure your blood pressure is controlled. Maybe even go ahead and put you on a beta blocker and then limit what you do exercise wise to prevent those dissections. But still right now our, our you know, primary way to prevent it is to do that surgery. And, and that's the last thing I'm, the one last thing I'm working on is trying to figure out what drives dissections because we just don't have a single drug that prevents dissection, not a single drug. And everybody for a risk for type A dissection at risk needs to have their chest broken open and the tube put in to prevent the dissections. So that's not too pleasant, but it does work and it's life-saving. So that's pretty much what I was going to say. I don't know what happened to my slides. I think they were Oh, they're ready. I was waiting well, well, for a moment to interject. Do you want to kick yeah, them off? Yeah, I, I think I covered what I needed to cover. So we'll, we'll, I was we'll thinking you didn't that. interrupt. I thought you were going to interrupt me, Josh. <laughs> so we'll, uh, in some ways, it may have been better without the slides, to be honest with you. <laughs> exactly. I, I got we'll the gift of gab. <laughs> we'll share them in the notes uh, below. Um, so Dr. Milowitz, so we'll get to the science in one second. But first, the last time I saw you in person, was in November at mile 18 of the New York Marathon. How does a genetic researcher from Texas end up at mile 18 of the New York Marathon <laughs> cheering? Okay, this is uh, this is a really tragic story. <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you why. 
So we, you know, we, I, I helped to identify the Marfan gene back when I was still in training. So when I started my own lab, I started going after the rest of the genes and we were recruiting families. We recruited this huge family with aortic dissections being passed from one generation to the next. And we had um, recommended everybody, um, we had some evidence that we had found the defective gene. So we had told everybody to get image, but then we called up everybody in the family that had the most likely the gene that was defective causing the dissection and really urged them to go get image. And this is a family that had about a hundred members in it. So, um, so one of the people we called up was a young man named Tyler Cayley and said, you know, you really need to go in and get image. And he was 19 at the time in, in college and very busy. And so he sort of blew it off and thought he'd just do it during summer break. But then one night he was studying for a test and he started having chest pain. And because his father had dissected and his uncle had died of a dissection and his grandfather died of a dissection, he knew that that was a symptom of an acute aortic dissection. So he went to his e local ER and um, they said, oh, you don't have Marfan syndrome and, and aortic dissections don't run in families. And it's just by chance that you're having chest pain, you have a cold or something, and they sent him home. And he continued to have chest pain, so he went to another ER, same thing. He went to a third ER with his mother, and his mother begged them to image him for a dissection. And they kept on saying, no, he doesn't have Marfan syndrome, and that's the only condition where it runs in families. Now, mind you, I had been publishing papers on it be, running in families without features of Marfan syndrome for over five or six years, you know, major papers in the literature. And, and um, so that night, Tyler Cayley went home from the third ER and a couple hours later, he was dead of a dissection. Mm -hmm. So this really was like a slap in the face for me because I'm doing all this research and publishing it and it's just not being adapted by people in the ER you know, let alone with, you know, family practitioners and so on. You think somebody that saw aortic dissection cases would keep up with the literature on the risk factors, but that wasn't the case at all. And so it made it clear to me that I really, I could do all the research I wanted to, but if it didn't get out there and doctors didn't learn about it, it was wasted and people were gonna continue to die of dissection. And about the same time, uh, one of the editors of the Wall Street Journal contacted me and said um, he had an aneurysm and he had read the literature and he knew that his family members needed to be imaged and he wanted to participate in our study. And so we went through all that. And then I said to him, you know, would you be interested in doing a story about how our families are mismanaged, starting with Tyler's story, but I had a bunch of other similar stories where multiple family members were dying of dissections and the doctors were still telling the family, you don't have Marfan syndrome, it's just by chance that everybody's dying of dissections. And so he looked into it and he ended up writing this huge article for the Wall Street Journal. Tyler Kelly's picture was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And that like changed things overnight. So it really was made it clear to me that there were ways of getting the word out there. And I've been involved in the Marfan Foundation, the John Ritter Foundation, the Genetic Aortic Disease Association of Canada, all these foundations I've been involved in to make sure the word gets out there and the correct, you know, clinical and medical and genetic information get out there. And I'm happy to say that the editor of the Wall Street Journal went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for that article. So mm -hmm. it was worth his while too. <laughs> yeah, well, so that's um, one of my, it's a very sad story, but I, it, it's, uh, it really shows the power of using the media and the patients to get the word out. So my involvement in the John Ritter Foundation was why I was at mile 18. <laughs> okay. Really long well, answer. For a short well, and that seems to really have 
um, just that in itself, I'm sure changed your perspective as far as, you know, you're doing all the work on, this, on the background and, and then seeing what's not really happening on the other end or with patients. And so we're glad that that kind of came to light though, and that, you know, the article hopefully changed things, but how do you think that um, things that were happening in genetics 10 years ago, how has that changed since, since then? Oh, I think we had, we, um, in the past 10 years, we found more genes. We launched the, an international consortium to collect patients with mutations and all the different genes that have been identified so that we know to, how to precisely manage them based on the gene. So um, that sort of, we're really pushing gene-based management, very precision medicine for this disease. And we're kind of at the forefront in terms in cardiovascular disease and pushing that agenda. So, um, but we still have a long ways to go to find the rest of the genes. And that's been a bit of a problem. I think we're gonna have some breakthroughs soon because we're put, pulling together all these different cohorts of patients to barely start to understand, uh, you know, those genetic triggers for dissection. Sure. And, um, and at the same time, there's like worldwide, they are taking medical records from people in hospitals or in countries and then just sequencing everybody and opening that data up so we can go into the uni United Kingdom biobank and pull out the 500 dissection cases and all their whole genetic sequencing for our studies. And we we ended up, they released that on mid-December and we had the data by January. No, maybe not quite that fast, but we were the one of the first people to get that data, the dissection data from. So, Dr. Milowitz, uh, um, you mentioned uh, familial connective tissue, and some of us are in your study, and and uh, I'm one of those weird families where I'm one of five or six siblings with aortic disease, and no apparent family history, you know, that we can really point to, and no known genetic trigger yet. And I guess the question is, and we're going to get to exercise in a minute, but before that, you know, are 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 we doomed by our genetic history? In other words, is our genetic history determinative of our course with this disease? Um, I, I think if you've got a pathogenic variant or a mutation in one of these genes, you're, you know, there's a high likelihood you're going to have thoracic aortic disease sometime in your lifetime. And with the data from that international consortium that I talked about, we can be very precise about when people are going to have an aortic event, either a dissection or need surgical repair. And so we can become very precise, but I wouldn't put it in as being doomed because mm. this is not Huntington's disease or Alzheimer's where we really don't have a good treatment yet where we can prevent it. This is a condition where I, it's not fun to go in and have your aorta repaired, but you know that mean once you do that, it means you you're going to have a normal life expense expectancy most likely. So it's something we can fix and repair. And in my view, I, I, I'd rather have an aortic predisposition than a predisposition for cancer or neurodegeneration or Alzheimer's and things like that. So we all get something in our genomes. And um, and I think in the big spectrum of things that having a predisposition for an aortic disease is not, not that bad, uh, except for when you don't know you have it. And right. that's when you can have the deadly dissections and all the complications associated with di dissections. So as, as the genetics is evolving, is blood pressure management, has that evolved? And importantly, how is your thinking on exercise evolved or has it evolved, you know, over the last 10 or 20 years? I think exercise has evolved a lot in our understanding of how good it is for the cardiovascular system. And um, 
And I think that goes for patients with aortic disease. And in fact, in some of the mouse models of aortic disease, if they are put on the treadmill and run, it slows the growth of the aorta. So that aerobic exercise is good. And I don't think it's like, I don't think it's doing anything magical. It's just when you, when you get up and move, walk or run or swim, it lowers your blood pressure. And we all know that lowering your blood pressure is, is good for thoracic aortic disease. So, um, yeah, and, and I'm sure other people have been on this that are exercise experts and have advised that aortic, aerobic exercises are good, but you don't want to do it to exhaustion. But, um, but isometric exercises that tend to drive up the blood pressure are not good. And that's that heavy weight lifting and um, chin-ups and things like that. So um, I think the whole issue with um, exercise and uh, is, is related back to blood pressure that aerobic exercise will bring the blood pressure down and make things better, could slow the growth of an aneurysm and hopefully, you know, work towards preventing dissections in somebody who's at risk. Whereas anything that drives up your blood pressure, whether it's, you know, heavy weightlifting or, you know, Ill illicit drugs like crack cocaine or anything else that drives up the blood pressure drives a risk for aortic disease and dissections in particular. A dissection occurs when the blood goes from the inside of the lumen into the wall. And then once it's in the wall, it just tears that wall apart and can go up and down the aorta. And that initial tear is dependent on a weakness in the wall which we think genetics plays a my, major role in that, but it's also dependent on how hard the blood hits the wall. And that's where the hypertension comes in. It's just, it's just biomechanics, you know, it's all very simple. Like I said, I like cardiovascular medicine because it's simple <laughs> to think <laughs> about, you know, it's a matter of a weak wall and more forces is gonna lead to a dissection. Well, you know, you were talking about how it took you a while to get the message across to physicians like in the ER. So I think one of our questions in general of the aortic athletes and people who are living active lifestyles is when the consistency between provider um, guidance is going to, you know, when is, when is the guidance going to be more consistent? Because a lot of times patients will say that their providers are still sharing, you know, serious restriction and caution with them. And then you have someone else who they're saying, just go live your life and you can go exercise and this and that. Because even, even today, I responded to a woman who was um, saying something about, you know, run, not running. And I said, well, some patients can, you know, everybody has different complexities that happen during the dissection or complications that happen thereafter. But I think we're all looking forward to providers getting the message that exercise is okay, you know? Yeah, so that's where we turn to the American Heart Association, and I'm also very involved in the American Heart. So for cardiovascular disease, they set the guidelines, and they have um, guidelines for thoracic aortic disease that include exercise recommendations. And then they have separate exercise recommendations for people with cardiovascular disease. So um, there is always a big push to get all physicians aligned with the guidelines. And they put out these guidelines so that everybody across the US will have the same standard of care. And that standard of care is evidence-based. And so the guidelines are there, the exercise recommendations are there. I think we need more evidence in terms of what people can or can't do. And that's what's lacking. And I know the John Ritter Foundation has funded some post-dissection exercise studies. And I'm hoping that we can expand. There's a, a, a study in children with Marfan syndrome to see, first of all, if they just exercise, does their blood pressure go up or does it go down? 
and they've shown it goes down. And the next question is, does it slow the growth of the aneurysms in those patients? But all that's being done in children and nothing's been done in adults yet. And so I think we have to pick up those studies. So because the guidelines are completely, are, they try to base everything on evidence that there's good clinical studies that the re recommendation they're making are legitimate. And if short of that, they go to consensus of experts. So a lot of the uh, exercise recommendations are consensus of experts, and that just doesn't carry as much weight. So we just need good solid evidence of the benefit of, of um, exercise. But I can tell you for every single cardiovascular disease, it's good to get up and walk around. All of them get better with exercise. So, yeah, maybe we need a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist to write on right. aortic disease and exercise. <laughs> yeah, well, I told Kevin when he ran the Pulitzer, I called him up and I said, you owe me. Because <laughs> 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 I'm well, the one who twisted his arm to do the study, to do the so, article. So last question, and then maybe we'll ask Joshua to see if there's some questions from our group. So uh, maybe you can help us. So if a ascend... Is ascending disease tends to be genetic? Is it different for descending aortic aneurysms? Is it different if you have both? If you've ascended into the descending, what are they? Are they? Is the do you expect the uh, amount of familial connective tissue disorder genetic tracers to dramatically increase from where it is today from twenty percent? I, uh, the data says that both ascending and descending dissections have a genetic predisposition that is about the same. And through our studies, we can really show that, that if we, um, in terms of the number of people with mutations in the genes that we know about. And ironically, if we look at people with type A dissections, those ascending versus descending, more people have with have mutations in the genes we know about in uh, uh, the percentage of patients with those mutations is higher with descending dissections. And we think it's maybe because they ascending dissections, um, those people often don't make it to the hospital, unfortunately. So that may be sort of messing up our statistics a little bit. But both of them seem to have a pretty strong genetic predisposition. Now, the ascending dissections, there's almost always enlargement of the aorta beforehand, that aneurysm forms. Descending, that's not the case. So we don't, we can say to somebody, you're at risk and we do blood pressure control, but we don't have a way to prevent those dissections yet. Um, really trying to work with the surgeons to figure out how we do that. And there may be ways to put like non-invasively or endovascularly, put thread a catheter up and put a little graft there to prevent those dissections in the future. But then the descending aneurysms, those are not part of the spectrum. And so that's a completely different disease. It gets very complicated. It gets complicated for cardiologists. <laughs> yeah, Carmen, you don't, I don't, I, Carmen, if I remember right, I don't think you've identified sort of a family member or, or family history for your descending. Right. Yeah. So I had a dissection from uh, basically the bottom of the curve, so the subclavian all the way down into my left iliac. So it went the full length of my aorta, and I've not had any family history that we know of. And my mother sent in her information. My biological father is deceased, so I can't get anything from him. And uh, nothing came from my mother. And um, so, yeah, we didn't really have an answer other than my own genetics that were collagen mutations. But again, like she just said, it can get really complicated, especially the genetics and what's pathogenic and non-pathogenic. So at this time, there's not really an answer. It's just there's an unknown a variant of unknown significance or people hear it as uh, BUS. And so... I am patiently waiting for Dr. Milowitz to continue her work. So Me too. maybe one day we can get an answer. And because it is important, like she was saying, for all these families, I mean, I worry about my kids and am I the beginning of the family history? Because I mean, I am, and I want to hopefully prevent those kinds of 
tragic deaths in my future generations, you know? So, yeah. Well, I think, uh, are we ready for Josh? I'm right, ready. Josh, I think we're ready for some live questions. All right. So uh, first I have a statement with a follow-up question. Um, let me see here. Hi, Brad. Uh, Brad had an aortic di uh, root aneurysm 5.1 two years ago, which was discovered incidentally and repaired six weeks later. Before his surgery, he was tested for genetic links and the results were negative. His son, who was eight at the time, was tested to check his aorta. He was within normal range, but on the high side. His question, how often should he be checked with no genetic or family history? Um, I think that I don't know what on the high side means. And so I, it's kind of difficult. I mean, if he really had an abnormal aorta, he should be checked on a yearly basis. If not, then probably I would check him again um, in a few years just to make sure it's normal. But um, in, especially if he wants to play football or, or some sort of contact sport, make sure he gets another echo a little bit late, right before he tries any of those types of sports. Is it like a 50-50 chance of inheriting? If, if Well, if you know it's being passed family. down from one generation to the next, the inheritance is typically what we call autosomal dominant. And that's a 50-50 chance. So that's the Marfan genes, the lowest stage genes, and most of the genes we've identified. But they can show up new in somebody due to a new mutation. And then it gets passed in the family to 50% of that individual's offspring. But then you have those people that we have called sporadic disease where there's no family history. And they go on to have children that don't have problems. So um and we don't know what the case is until we image everybody then if everybody's negative then we're pretty sure it's a sporadic case but so in children uh, i would when they're that young they may not have developed the aneurysm yet so i still would check them a few more times as they grow five out of uh, five out of six siblings we just won the aortic lottery in my family i guess <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have sporadic <laughs> no, no, you don't. Yeah, you, you're, you know, it's 50 50. It's a flip of the coin or a toss, you know. It, so it it's not, you head. can get five out of six that have aortic disease <laughs> with that, unfortunately. Just like you can have five brothers and one sister, you know, that's yeah. also a flip of a coin. We have five brothers and one sister, and only the boys have it. There it yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Joshua, what else? Okay. Uh, hi, Alan. Alan says, I have a 4.2 ascending and a 3.9 root. It hasn't grown in 17 years. Severe mm -hmm. high blood pressure, and it has never grown. Uh, obese, celiac, anemic, and am I just an anomaly? I lifted heavy for the first four years as well. I, I think that's very good news, and I, do, I think it's fantastic that it hasn't grown, and he just needs to continue to follow it. I, I uh, the, uh, and technically you don't have a true aneurysm until it's up to 4.5 or so. And so you're like in that pre aneurysm stage. So hopefully it'll stay the same, but I would encourage you, your cardiologist may recommend going to every other year, but please still continue to control your blood pressure, especially if it tends to be very high. And with yes. exercise. Yeah, and, and you can get out and walk around. That may help you being overweight. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's going to be right in the wheelhouse of this next question. Hi, Bill. Mm -hmm. Bill says, question for Dr. Milowitz. Can you please comment on exercise guidance slash res restrictions for people who have had elective surgery for a TAA as opposed to, to post-dissection? I think the recommendations we make for both groups are the same. So he's uh, the person after an aneurysm repair 
you're still at a low risk for that descending dissection because we know you already had a problem with part of your aorta. So I think blood pressure management and exercise limitations should be the same. But I'd be a little bit less worried about with somebody that has undergone an aneurysm repair versus somebody who has dissected their aorta. Because when you have a like an ascending dissection, they emergently go in and repair the first part of the aorta, but the rest of the aorta can be dissected all the way down the, the aorta, all the way to the arteries that go into the legs, those iliac arteries. So post dissection, you do have abnormal aorta. So we really want people to follow um, exercise recommendations with those when they have sections of their aorta dissected. And maybe a little bit less worried if you have an aneurysm and they've gone in and repaired the aneurysm because then they've taken out all the, you know, uh, diseased tissue. But we still worry about there's still being a risk for the rest of the tissue and a risk for descending dissections. And maybe also that uh, the exercise uh, intensity level for a person who's been repaired with no dissection may be also a little bit higher than for someone like me who's dissected all the way down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Alan. Uh, he also heard that if you have an ascending you also have a 5% chance of a brain aneurysm. That was posted by a doctor about 10 years ago who was doing a study on aneurysms. I don't think the risk, I don't remember seeing any study where the risk, but you're talking about an ascending aneurysm or ascending dissection. I think he, he said a, a brain aneurysm, Joshua? Well, he said, I think he asked whether if you have ascending disease, are you going to go on to have a brain aneurysm? Right. Yeah. Are you at a 5% risk for a brain aneurysm? So um, I've, I've not seen a study where they found that association. We do know with certain genes that they can go on to have brain aneurysm, and we recommend screening for those genes. And those genes tend to be the genes that cause low estate syndrome. Uh, to answer your question, he just says he had a 4.2 ascending. Oh, yeah, but so we do not recommend people with just a 4.2 ascending aneurysm. We don't recommend them be screened for aneurysms in their brain unless they have a mutation in one of the low estate syndrome genes or they have somebody in their family that has had an aneurysm in their brain. Okay. Is that, you think we got the right answer out there? It feels right to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we have some anonymous questions. Um, patients who submitted saliva sample in 2019, will they now need to do it again since it was said nothing was found? No, no, you're part of our bank, and we'd probably have taken that DNA sample and sequenced it, and now your genome sequencing data is part of our study. So that doesn't change. Your DNA is like a hard copy, and it doesn't, it doesn't change over time, so there's no need to get an additional sample. In some cases, we need to go back and resequence for whatever reason and we may come back to people to ask for additional samples but that's pretty rare so, so to follow that, that up um the question might also be geared towards how did they know of updated variant you know if the variants that maybe they were found are now going to be updated how do they go where did they go to find up find that information so if okay, I have my VUS and it says nothing right now, in 10 years it may say something. So where would I go to check that? I think you need to check back with your, your cardiologist and or geneticist, whoever you work for, work, work with to um, do your clinical genetic testing. Um, just to sort of clarify our research study, um, we're a research lab and we don't do clinical genetic testing. So whoever, anybody that comes into our study, we really like them to have that testing first. So we know they don't have a mutation in a known 
in a known gene. If they can't get that, we'll go ahead and collect their sample. And if we find anything, we'll report it back to them. And then as we find new genes, we will report back to you anything that we have to, anything that's clinically actionable. That means anything that is going to affect your care or your family member's care. So that will all be reported back to the family members. But remember, even when we find a new gene, it may be years before we can report that information because it has to be validated by committees, by committee, by that, that, clin, that uh, aortopathy panel, the specialist. Okay. Sorry, my father is 95. I think he forgot I was doing <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> That was okay. that like phantom person back there. <laughs> Sorry That's about light. that. <laughs> uh, okay, so Melissa says, did we discuss how to become part of the bank? Uh, so it, you can go ahead and contact me and I will forward you inf your information um, to whoever is responsible for recruiting those patients in our study. So those unsolved families, um, they would by and large go to Bella, Moran. And then if you have a mutation in a known gene, we'd be happy to recruit you into our study trying to make sure that we have precise management of those patients. And that is a young man named Ernesto who's doing that recruitment. And I think uh, I'll have, Josh, I'll have Josh put those in the video and that way. Yeah, and we can them. probably go ahead and provide all that information, the contact information to, to directly contact those individuals. And I, I think also uh, folks can go to the John Ritter Foundation website to get a way in yeah. as well. So that's always a, a, a well-known way in. So if you look into the future, you said in the future, maybe our whole genomes will be like part of our medical records is uh is does the do you think the future will hold like uh, crispr editing of uh of of aortic dna and clipping out some of the bad pieces what do you yeah think? so so yeah once we know what that changes in the dna the ideal thing would be go in and and correct it to re-edit it and we have the technology to do that now and so I see that in the future, and there are groups working on that. A group in Harvard is working on a gene that I identified in a very severe end of the spectrum for that gene, trying to edit um, the change that causes children to have dissections. So they, it's nowhere near being used in the patients. It's probably a ways off, but I think we'll get there. But that will only work if we know that that for that, you know, 20% of the disease where we know they have a change in their DNA that confers that very high risk for thoracic aortic disease. The rest of the patients, we think they all have some type of genetic predisposition, but they're low risk genes and they have to be combined with either other gene mutations. So somebody has a hit here in their genome and a hit over here and together they cause the disease or they have that hypertension or they've taken an aortic toxin by mistake and didn't know about it. So there's something, it's a combination of having a genetic predisposition and an environmental risk factor. Okay. Uh, hi, Amanda. She asks, I had a type B dissection at 28 years old. Now I'm 33. I had a VUS in COL3A1, and all activities I do make my heart do 120 or up. What should I do? Sorry about her English. <laughs> Okay, she needs to be on a beta blocker, first of all, especially if her heart rate's going so high with exercise. And I would have put her on a beta blocker even without that, given that she dissected her aorta so young. I sort of wonder if she was pregnant when she had the dissection, because that's one of those environmental risk factors for dissection. And in those cases, it's not because the it, they can occur in people, in women that don't even have hypertension during pregnancy. It's just because your blood volume 
goes up by a third when you're pregnant with a child. So you can make sure you provide enough nutrients through the placenta to the child. So that can drive a dissection. And um, yeah, so I think she has to make sure that her the very first part of the aorta is carefully watched for an aneurysm um, formation. Get on those beta blocker and a beta blocker, and then um, certainly undergo genetic testing, even if there's no family history. Because in a woman like her, we know that 12% of those patients have an underlying genet a pathogenic variant that's gone undiagnosed. We know that from studies we're getting ready to publish. It, well, it and does sounded that, like uh, yeah. I think she has a, uh, I think she did genetic testing already. Oh yeah, the B, yes, that's right. The variant. She sounded very similar to mine because that's exactly one of the gene mutations that I have and I was 33 when it happened, you know, um, so I, I have the same. That's concept. very similar, <laughs> but yours with pregnancy associated, right? And, and yes, and then, and that's, you know, what they said it was due to the um, pregnancy. So like you were talking about, like there might be something else, whether it's obesity and a variant or pregnancy or something else that kind of makes it kind of come out. So the other thing we're getting to ready to publish is that if you look at dissection cases, the burden of those VUSs is much, much higher than if you look at people that haven't had dissection. So it tells us that those VUSs are increasing the risk for disease. And we're trying to work through some bioinformatics and AI to really better identify the risk with those VUSs. So stay and, tuned. And remind me, because my simple brain, what VUS is again, it's not, it's not a, a kind of television, I take it. It's uh, something. No, no. So when you do genetic testing, it can come back, there's nothing found. But often it comes, or it can come back that you definitely have a mutation in the gene, or a, we call it pathogenic variants because people don't like to be told they're mutants. <laughs> you know, they have a mutation, and so, but and and or it can come back that you have a change and it's totally benign. We know it's not causing the disease. But what happens frequently is there a ch there's a change in the gene and we don't know if it's causing disease or not. And that's a variant of uncertain uh, significance or a VUS. So we know yeah. the VUSs are more common in people with dissections. And, and right now we can use some parameters and, and pick out those that we know confer a high a risk that's as high as a pathogenic variant. So I think as we move forward, we'll do better and better with the VUSs. Well, I'm looking Dr. forward to those findings coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're writing the paper now. <laughs> well, we'll look for it. And uh, Dr. Diana Milowitz, we aortic athletes are so encouraged by you and we, we are in your debt. And I hope anyone who's listening, uh, if they have genetic testing, if they haven't had genetic testing, go to the John Ritter Foundation where you can find out more about participating, about sending in your data. It's up to us, I think. It's up to us really to provide you the raw information, you and your computer, the information yeah. you need to uh, to crunch the DNA and identify some of these genes so we can do a better job of, uh, of uh, treating and, and have better outcomes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we are grateful to you, uh, Dr. Milowitz, and uh, thank you for being a friend of the aortic community. We, I know, uh, you know, you know Carmen well, and uh, we, we really just appreciate you and thank you for all you're doing for us. Yeah, I love partying with Carmen at any time. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've seen each other from time to time over the last almost nine years. Well, I guess, I guess I met you almost what, six months afterwards. So eight and a half years, um, I have known Dr. Milowitz. And since yeah. I have worked a lot with the John Ritter Foundation, volunteering and doing stuff and attending events, I, I see her from time to time. <laughs> yeah, it's always good. So thank, you for, thank you for being here, Dr. Milowitz. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I was so excited when I got the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so okay. much. Okay, good night. Good night.